Going live in. We're live and recording. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we all doing? It's Alex here, as always, hosting today's second uh, live webinar for the Festival of Enterprise. Um, hope you're all well. Thank you for everybody posting up. Um, Peter Henry, Simon, Ben, Hannah, um, Simon, Joanne, AK. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. I'm thinking it's kind of like a countrywide thing, this heat wave that, uh, that we've got. Good afternoon, Karma, for jumping in as well. I have to do a school run. School run, is it a half day? I've got to do one at three o'clock, but uh, it's a half day. Um, yeah, absolutely scorching here in Poole in Dorset. Um, believe it is um, where Jane is in, in Marlow in Buckinghamshire as well. Yeah, very hot. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you for joining us uh, today. We are rethinking customer retention and loyalty in a post-COVID world. So I'm joined by Jane Dixon, MD at Willow Ridge Digital. So, Jane... Um, He's got over 15 years experience in customer retention, email and marketing automation. And what we're going to be talking about today is how you can supercharge your customer retention and loyalty. She's going to be sharing a 10 point plan for re-engineering your customer engagement and loyalty strategies to maximize retention with examples from a bunch of different industries, including retail, sports and leisure. So little bit of housekeeping for those of you who are joining for the first time, and I do recognize some uh, familiar names, obviously. Um, so thank you for joining us again. Uh, Joshua's just joined us, Beatrice as well, Katie melting in Preston, and Ben is in Bromsgrove in Worcestershire. Um, yes, yeah, so questions for Jane, please pop them in the chat box there, and we'll both get to see them. Um, We'll try and answer them at, at the end, as I find we do end up going down in quite a few rabbit holes if we answer them mid, mid flow. So I hope that's all right for everyone. But we will get through every question um, rather than the ask a question tab. So if you use the chat function, it means Jane will get to see them as well as me at the end of the presentation. Um, so that will be super helpful. And just any commentary as well, guys and girls, any commentary you've got on the points Jane mentions, that's always helpful. Um, and like myself, feel free to post up your LinkedIn so we can have a bit of networking on it. People can connect with each other. I think you never know what connections you make and what they can lead to in the future uh, with regards to you and your business. So please feel free um, to do that as well. Mine's at the top and I'm sure we can add Jane's. Uh, what's the easiest way for people to contact you, Jane? Is it email? Is it LinkedIn? Um, email, LinkedIn. I've got a couple of different options right at the end of the presentation. but. Okay. Um, yeah, e email and LinkedIn is probably the easiest ones. Great. Okay. So I'm going to get Jane um, to go into presentation mode with her uh, presentation. I'm um, going to focus the screen up. Hi, Giles. Thanks for joining us as well. Well done, Hannah. Straight on the draw. Do feel free to connect with me. I'm always happy to connect with everybody. Uh, I think I've got literally like another six, 700 connections since we started doing these um, back in March. And we're now up to, we'll be coming up to, episode 150 very soon which is bonkers and i'm sure i'm due some kind of guinness world record i'm waiting for them to uh, arrive with the, with the book so well done ellie as well always the females that are quicker on the draw with the with the connecting i don't know why that is I'm sure a psychologist would have a field day right and Anne, there you go boom another female done it as well straight away <laughs> love it well done guys and girls that's great um, okay, so we are rethinking customer retention and loyalty in a post-COVID world. Uh, Jane Dixon is here. I'm going to knock off our video to, pre to preserve a bit of bandwidth. And um, yeah, Jane, take it away. Over to you. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Alex. Appreciate it. Uh, lovely to chat, everybody. As I said, I'm going to answer a bunch of questions right at the end of the presentation. Um, it's a bit difficult with my setup to actually see you firing things through, but believe me, I'll get round to, to answering lots of stuff, and hopefully there'll be some great debate. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview on who I am and what we do, um, I'm the founder of Willow Ridge Digital. We're a very new agency. I got it up and running last year. 
Um, but we're specialists in designing, delivering and managing CRM strategies and loyalty schemes. So um, I've got over 15 years experience because I'm pretty old, um, working with clients across retail, travel and leisure. Um, and what I've tried to do is put together a bunch of things that we're looking at in the market and we're actively working on with our customers, both in the long term and short term, and share those ideas with you and get your feedback and see if it's relevant. So, and, and I try to include ideas that have a, a wide application, so not just the particular sectors that I've got experience in, but that can be applied more broadly as well. So first of all, what I wanted to touch upon is what we actually mean by loyalty, because it's important to put some context around it. So in the points that I'm going to talk to in a moment, where I'm actually referring to the emotional relationship that leads a consumer to choose to purchase goods and services from one brand versus another. And I think that's quite distinct from habitual loyalty. You know, you go to the corner shop because it happens to be there. They might also be very nice people there, um, but you know, you, you just do, do it out of habit because it's convenient or transactional because it's price-based, like the, the big German discounters. It's about creating that emotional connection. And to me, that's what loyalty really means, aside from all the platforms, the technologies and services that, that surround it. It's a really about that relationship. So why is this important? I don't think anybody's going to have any, you know, any problem with the fact that we are in a different world. Um, if we think about how, how changed the world it is, we've incomes have decreased there's lower consumer confidence and uncertainty will will inevitably continue so uh, according to ernst and young uh, consumer index 42 percent of consumers believe that the way they shop will fundamentally change so we've got to be much more clever um, at engaging and retaining customers. So hopefully at the end of this, you're gonna have a few takeaways at least that will help you with your business and how you, how you drive that forward. So, as I said, for me, loyalty is about the emotional engagement, the, the, the emotional relationship between your business and, and your customer. And that comes, what the components that make up for a great emotional relationship are the customer experience, how you engage with them on an ongoing basis, and the authenticity with which you say things. It's really important, particularly in this world where people are making many more value-based judgments. Um, and we see the, the rise of um issues like um you know black lives matter etc we 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 business has to operate within um a much more diverse context these days so let's on to the, go on to the practicalities rfm is dead now most people are going to have a bunch of data sources to help them understand trends in their, in their customer actions and interactions. So historically, retailers have used RFM models, recency, frequency, and monetary value. And typically, those big old customer data platforms would look do a 90-day look back to understand customer purchasing patterns and transactions transactions but historical models have always been a pretty poor proxy for future behavior and we can be pretty confident that nowadays what your customers did before isn't going to be the same as what they did in uh, what they're going to do in the future and and even if you if that was true your data is pretty screwed up anyway so my recommendation is to to think about in the moment personalization and by that it's you you know more broadly we can think about ai based um systems which will tune into micro patterns of behavior so people think act where people start on um, a search and selection journey, for example, or the the um, criteria they use to find your products and services online, where they come from, what they do. So if we think about those much, much bigger systems, you could go for a huge replacement approach, 
but more effective for most people is going to be about rethinking their CRM strategy and, and connecting the diverse systems that most, even the smallest businesses are going to be using to, to um, communicate with their customer support, you know, whether it's Zendesk for, for um, customer queries, uh, your Google Analytics, it's, it's being able to pull all of that data in to get a really rich view of the customer and, and action it it effectively now projects like that can take quite a long time I did, you know don't don't deny that at all so one of the ways in which i would recommend getting around this is focusing in in the short term on search queries and your analytics for key engagement points and automate around them it's never been easier with with platforms like segment zapier integromat to link up key engagement points and automate the response around it. Now, I've shown a picture of Amazon on the right hand side way back in the day when I was um, a web analyst um, and, and focusing on email as well. We would say if you knew nothing else about your customer, a key bit of information that you can action is whether or not they go for next day delivery. And this was way before Amazon decided to make a whole business out of it. And that's what they've done. They've built a whole business around next day delivery. So I would say look for those nuggets in your data and optimize around them. So if RFM is dead, what else do we do? Um, well, engagement is key. And there's been some great ex um, examples of brands keeping customers engaged throughout the crisis when you know they may not have been able to sell their products and the customers may not have been able to buy the products but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be talking to your customers so we've got high-end brands like Moncler have been you know pumping out playlists to keep the you know, very on brand um, quite exciting you, um, and you've had brands like Life where it's very homely and friendly just sending out spot the differences competitions which are just nice pieces of engagement and I think that kind of brand experience is more important than ever and the key thing is getting it consistent across all your channels um, and analyzing those ideas are separate from the channel so you know, telling a story, how is that abstracting the story itself from the channel in which you've communicated it? The way, way in which to do that longer term is obviously platforms like digital asset management systems. So you can, you know, consistently ensure you've got the same version of, of an asset, you're repurposing it on social channels it, um, compared to your, your web instances, etc. But in the short term, I would be, I'm such a huge advocate of just telling a story about your product and service, whether you, know, you sell, um, you know, chairs, sofas, coats, or, or you know, financial services, you know, what makes you different, why are you worth talking to, um, and what's special and unique about your product or services, tell a story. So, telling a story is one half of, of, of the strategy. The other half is listening in to your um, customers and what they're doing and, and what they're saying to each other. So the unfiltered um, chatter that goes that goes on. At a much um, bigger end, in the longer term, <clears throat> there's a huge advantage in, in investing in social media monitoring tools that listen out to all of that chatter, make sense, create indexes about um, whether there's you know, positive mentions of your brand or negative mentions um, they can have a real competitive advantage so um, shoe brand Tom's is a fantastic brand um, they did some social listening figured out that actually a load of their audience were really <laughs> into my little pony I suspect that was the the uh, parents with with younger children so they developed a, a my little pony sh um, themed shoe and it sold out in 48 hours so you know, now is the time to listen in closely. And whilst social media monitoring tools may be beyond the budget of, uh, of uh, many businesses, 
what is within budget and within capability is, is to use attitudinal surveys and iterative profiling. Whilst you're talking to your customers about your brand proposition and your storytelling, ask them about them as well. So um, this is a, an approach that I have implemented with a, a whole bunch of retailers. It's about asking your consumers to tell you about them, you know, what kind of fashion style do they have? How often do they use your tools? How often do they work out and keep a conversation going using this? And there are a bunch of off the shelf um, tools that, that can do this for you and you can integrate the data in, back into your systems and use it to better understand your customers. So, um, I'm not going to go into this in a huge amount of detail because it's, you know, but I think influence market, marketing is still an important part of the customer experience. Um, it's a challenging one in the current environment. I mean, most of us don't have fear of missing out because there isn't anything much to miss out on. Although having said that, with the pubs opening again, we might be back into that realm again. Um, but people do need a bit of light relief. They still look for inspiration on social channels. And I think it's it's something that's not just for fashion. There is a huge trend towards micro influencers, people who do not have a massive following, but they're really well regarded for what they do, whether it's baking sourdough, um, wearing pretty dresses, or you know, able to maintain a, a motorbike, um, you know, the specialists in their area. And I think this is where building in micro influences, creating a conversation, adding authenticity to your brand is really important in the long term. In the short term, one of the things that I focused on, particularly when we're looking at CRM data and building models about who customers are, my first place, my first go to is, is their Instagram feed. People have mentioned their products and it's really interesting how different somebody's customer can actually look to, to, to what their model of them is. And that's where the, there can be a disconnect. So the, the, the guy on the, on the right there, you can see on your screen, he was, um, I've been working with a new fashion brand. He was one of their followers and he was so far removed from what, who they saw as their, their customer base. And yet this guy, absolute dude, you know, has thousands of followers. He's a blues player in the, in, uh, America and really, really influential, and yet they weren't nurturing the, the, this this guy um, for for their benefit. So get a conversation going, and then figure out who your followers are and leverage them. Um, building on that theme of social messaging, I think another huge thing that um, I've seen very recently over the last year is the integration of social proof into everything. Um, it's enormously impactful. So um, from various studies, we know that um, where you have user generated content on a page on your website, that the um, people will spend 90% more time there. It increases email click through rates by 73%. And I think where this comes into play in the current context around COVID, it really eases the minds of worried consumers when you can show that people like them are using your products and are comfortable using it. And it's not just the star ratings. Again, it's it's bring thinking about that sort of micro influencer approach. It's it's showing how real people use your um, wear your products um, and and building that in. And I would say over the longer term, you should be building in elements of social proof across your lifecycle marketing from the moment somebody signs up to your service to when they purchase as part of your retention programs. And it should be at every key conversion point across your website as well. But, you know, if that seems a bit daunting, you've got to revisit all of that. One of the techniques that we've seen work really well is little competitions that are socially focused that generate 
um, user generated card notes, and that's nominating your friends and challenger type competitions. So little videos, I mean, TikTok is enormous, but little short videos of you doing something, making something, wearing the product, playing with the product, having fun with the product, or service, doing whatever. Um, and, and having a bit of a challenge and get people to vote on it. Again, there's a bunch of platforms that will support you in doing that. And it's really rich, engaging content. And most of all, it's free when um, you know, our budgets are pretty constrained in, in, the, in the current circumstances. So that's visual merchandising. Um, again, as we move back into stores um, another area that we've been working on with customers and looking at in quite a lot of detail is how to use um, channels like um, messenger apps and um, whatsapp to support customers and if you think about um, well whatsapp usage has increased by 148 um, percent since last february so it's rising exponentially as people need to find different ways to connect with each other but also because people have fewer opportunities to talk to somebody face to face then we've seen Zendesk has reported the highest ever um, numbers of tickets in May so thinking about how to support customers through other channels is really important I think these are two really nice examples which and on the longer term you, know, you need to work, go through your customer data, figure out all the different um, turning points, you know, different areas of, of support the customers need. But if you're thinking about how many people are just going to be stood out in a queue outside a store, why not encourage them to start their shopping journey via a bot outside and, and guide them through to the kind of products you've got? And there's a lot of stuff you can be doing right now on this however for people that are maybe a little bit more hesitant about going down this route and more cautious i would say why not just provide you know crosswords as somebody's queuing outside a store um and then more yeah maybe it's a little bit facile but but another absolutely crucial thing you know we're launching a brand with um, with Chelsea Football Club at the moment and is making sure that all the support staff have to hand all of the communications that are going out on whatever channel and that we're there to support them so so support staff have everything they need at hand um, to, to immediately respond but so my key takeaways here are keep people entertained ensure support staff have got everything they need um, but really look closely at Messenger and WhatsApp. There's again a bunch of platforms on on the market that can make you make this really easy to implement, and it's and it's extremely effective. So, thinking further now, contactless commerce. So, at the high end, we've got shop, we've got shops completely re-engineering the customer experience with. Um, stores as a showroom rather than um, somewhat something you're going to browse in the traditional way you're moving products around um, because of covid we're going to be less able to do that we can't pick clothes up and and, and you know touch them randomly this was actually um, so the bomb pre idea that you can see on the screen was actually something that launched last year but now seems you know prophetic in in its design um, so Bonpre is a German um, retailer. It's a bit like Primark here in the UK. So it's very you know, value orientated. They're not swanky in any way. But what they've done is set up their stores as more of a pop up where people walk in, they see um, an outfit on a rack. It's just one single size. They um, scan the QR code on, on the label. They'll find the uh, the version, so they put in information about sizing on there, add it into a bag, and they can then um, purchase it and pick it up from somewhere in the store, or or they can wait and it's put, all put into a into a changing room for them. And if you think now about the, the constraints around numbers of people in a store, what they can touch and do, 
this is obviously a huge advantage. So most of these types of approaches do rely on app-based management. Now that's really about, you know, the challenges there are typically connecting up your um, stock and your store management with, with, with what can be seen in the app, which is no mean feat for most retailers. But I would suggest that there's a bit that you could take away from this, which is um, using QR codes. Now, way back in the day, you know, QR codes were the next big thing, and they're making a huge comeback. When you think that the government's just said that, you know, uh, menus can only be for single um, single use, and then they've got to be thrown away. Well, why don't you just have a plastic thing with a QR code so nobody touches it? Every single person can scan a QR code effectively now with their smartphone. It's built into all, all the modern versions of um, a camera, so it automatically pick them up. And you can lead that to a bot, a web page, wherever you like, and um, you can connect that up. But Using QR codes, whether it's in a shop window to purchase something, or in a restaurant to to show the menu, or in a tool store to show you more information about the use of that product, is a really good opportunity, and it's very straightforward and easy to do as well. From a CRM perspective as well, um, that touch point you, built into it, you can add some net metadata to say, you know, give you some more information about the how, where, and when of, of who, 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 who engaged with you um, when they use that QR code. So I think that's a, a, a really nice little quick win there. More um, sort of forward thinking is you know, use of AR and VR type technologies and. I think from from a a more low tech version of this is um, the increase over the period with uh, virtual consultations, particularly in the beauty world. Although interestingly, not so much in the UK, but certainly been a big trend in um, the US and Canada has been big beauty brands like Lush providing on online virtual con consultations. And my hope is that we'd actually see a bit more of that here in the UK, because if it, even if it's, you know, your local hardware store and, and you're you know, a vulnerable person in lockdown and you've got to continue doing that, you know, being able to talk to somebody and talk through um, your needs is, is really important. So um, I think that's the, the sort of lower tech version. But when we think about things like augmented reality and virtual reality, there's some really interesting um, applications of those coming through. So Hitachi um, introduced um, an AR guided um, support, so for, for, for manuals that's coming through. Really, really interestingly, uh, went and visited Bosch Siemens um, showroom last year and they're looking at using virtual reality for three-dimensional walkthroughs of their products now it's actually a, an interesting application because they're using it primarily for old boilers so if you think about your heating system not very relevant right now this minute um, but imagine the depths of the water of winter your heating breaks down because you've got a boiler that's 20 years old when you talk to somebody on um, on a phone or online, um, they need to try and explain to you or, or try and diagnose what the issue might be. Now, for many, you know, if you've got a boiler that's twenty years old, and that's um, you know, if you've got an older house like I do, that is perfectly you know perfectly expected. Um, you need to be able to see it in three dimensions, and that's what Bosch Siemens are is investing in VR for is actually customer support so they can talk people through, they can see the product in three dimensions and walk them through the challenges that they may be having. It might be a stuck valve or something like that. And they see that as a really good investment for cutting down the costs around customer support for those types of products. So I think in a, in a longer term, it's worth um, businesses looking at AR um, not just for user manuals, but but adding more information about the products they're selling, maybe t doing some of that storytelling around the product. Um, and in the shorter term, 
providing customers with the opportunity for virtual sales consultations, even if you're the hardware store on the high street, there's still a role for, you know, getting on a, uh, on a phone or a Zoom call and talking to a, a customer about their needs. And anybody can do that. So another opportunity that I think is becoming more and more significant um, as voice technologies grow is voice-based services. And by this, I don't simply mean smart speakers. If we think about um, Siri on our phones, uh, all the different connected things, and actually um, even on Windows products, they in um, use of search and browsers risen by 20% apparently in the last year. So voice across, whether it's um, using at a desktop, laptop, or a connected device in the home is becoming more and more important. And actually, there's a wide range of no-code platforms for building voice apps. Then this isn't the specialist area that it used to be. So this is something that's within reach of smaller businesses, and actually could be quite an agile way of of engaging with their customer. Again, thinking about the you know small hardware store on a high street you know if you could say right i need a packet of screws your wood screws get and get them ready for delivery in five minutes you turn up grab them and away you go what a fantastic customer experience that would be you know stood in a queue for 40 minutes while somebody goes and fumbles in a in a you know in a storeroom to try and get you the product more um, sort of brand orientated services like Send Me a Sample um, have had a huge rise in popularity. And whilst they may, might be really quite expensive, um, they actually have a huge success rate. So Send Me a Sample is really popular uh, one on um, smart audio devices, and that's got a 40% conversion rate. So I would highly recommend uh, businesses look at how they can use voice to enhance customer service um, and streamline purchasing as well. But if not, if you do nothing else, voice searches are becoming ever more important for for, for standard searching. So in the same way as you do your search engine optimization for um, input searches, you should start looking at optimizing for voice SEO as well, um, just uh, to make sure you maintain that advantage. And finally, if we think about traditional loyalty schemes, is there still a role, um, a role for them? Obviously, it's not something that I've focused on um, specifically in this talk. It's a really difficult one. There can be very big, complex things to maintain and manage. And the the general feedback from consumers is is, is not always positive. In fact, only one third of customers are actually satisfied with retail loyalty schemes. Um, they do work. 49% of customers spend more once they've joined a scheme. Um, but they can again be complex to, to to manage. You need quite a bit of kit in many circumstances. So seventy percent of schemes are accessed via an app. But I think the reason why there's a huge amount of, of um, dissatisfaction is for many consumer um, products and services, they're just not a right fit because of the uh, redemption periods. You know, the time, if you're selling sofas. You know, you can't easily drive somebody to 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 buy another sofa within a specific period of time, um, or it, you know, the the level of satisfaction you get is is just too deferred. It's too 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 far off in the future to to really make an emotional impact. And I think so. The key things are when you're looking at a if you already have a loyalty scheme then the focus has really got to be over this period in making sure you can, you can administer it as simplistically as possible with, with channels to market and marketing conditions, less time in a store, um, maybe fewer staff able to support customers, where you've got these 
complicated, elaborate loyalty schemes, they've got to be simplified and they've got to be really easy to understand for the customer as well. But if there are still lots of schemes that work and um, I, I love this one, this is Woohoo. Um, I bought a car, three of them. And actually one of the things they, they offer is planting trees, which I think is a you know beautiful one. If you think about how big a conversation point with tree planting was um, in the last election, if you can offer something social like this that creates that emotional connection, you know, is in line with your brand values uh, as a reward for the customer, then that can only be a really good thing. So that's all I've got for the moment. And I'm going to leave my contact details up on screen. Um, but hopefully that has given you a whole range of ideas of what to address in the short and long term. And, and I can't wait to hear what people have, have commented and what they're saying. Thank you, Jane. Much appreciated. Um, just brought us both onto video here. Um, Peter, what are you putting? I, just, I literally just seen the first comment. No, but you could sell them a bed. I don't know what the conversation was going on there. <laughs> I'm going to scroll back up. I've just been commenting okay. from people and uh, people have been posting up who they are and what they do, which is awesome. I think this is definitely a very engaged webinar. So Hannah says, which strategies could be most effective in a B2B environment selling a technical product? uh good question i would say it depends on whether uh, what the technical product is i mean i've been in i've worked for software companies for a long time and you know my, my specialism uh when i wasn't client facing was was helping to sell into other businesses and i think again um social proof and the communities we build around our products and services are equally as important if not more so um you know, customers want to hear from other customers regardless of what you sell. So I'd say that's the strategy. Build in, you know, customer feedback groups, opportunities to comment, get together, hopefully, when we're all allowed to again. Um, that's that's the way I'd approach those. Great. Thanks. Um, Ellie says she's found that Sainsbury's have really optimised their Nectar Point loyalty scheme to try and retain customers who are being pulled to cheaper options, i.e. oldies. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So um, if you look at what Tesco's did with their scheme, so um, Tesco's were absolutely on their knees. They had the biggest um, loss on their balance that I'd ever experienced in their entire mm. history. Uh, despite having a big loyalty scheme and a lot of that was due to the fact that whilst they had they had great penetration in market they had no such thing as emotional loyalty people were just going to tesco so there's so many of them you know it's, it's so convenient yeah. that habitual loyalty so they've actually completely re-engineered their their um loyalty scheme the same way because places like um yeah, Sainsbury's, etc., have. But again, a key part of that has been the focus on the customer experience. You can't do it. You know, just monetary rewards doesn't work. So Tesco has, has whole, overhauled their entire op proposition by putting more people on the ground, focusing on optimizing the customer experience, as well as those points based schemes. And I would say the other danger when we think about points based schemes is they are a massive um, hit for hackers so you think about boots etc they've all been hit within the last year because they're a really easy target and um, particularly at the moment when people might have the guard done a bit more mm. so, so yes there is a role for them they do work but they're difficult and costly to to manage quite often um, they're very attractive to hackers and sometimes identifying whether that's really driving customer behavior is a toughie actually just doing customer experience really well, it's probably just as good as um, a strategy. Yeah, H Hannah says, I've been really put off by the big food retailers due to the actions they've taken during COVID. I will never return to Tesco. Um, yeah. Hannah says, to your previous point, it's a SaaS product in the fire industry with regard to the technical. Okay, well, I mean, it's it's hard to picture what that is in my mind, but, but if you yeah. 
if you'd like to to reach out to me directly I'd, I'd love to have a chat so we'll We'll put the details back on and also we'll follow up after the, the webinar with a copy of the presentation if anyone wants to download it from my site and and all the contact details i'll be very happy to to have a, a more direct chat with everybody um and we talk through specifics but i don't know a huge amount about the fire industry but love to learn more <laughs> yeah thank you um so yeah a few more few more questions um fabio's got a really good question what are the best tools for measuring success please uh, well you're gonna hate my answer because you know <laughs> how long is a piece of string it depends what yeah. success means for you whether it is and it depends on you know the the frequency with which you sell your product so you know if you're a burberry of this world it's it might success might be everybody talking about you um may not actually be measured in unit sales if you're you know um a grocers then it's share of market share of wallet if if you're a fashion more general fashion retailer then you know it's it's you know presence of mind it's you know um recognition of the brand so i think there's a lot of elements to to that um i think in a crm context looking at more traditional measures like uh engagement with with marketing comms is a is a really you know one that everybody should measure and retention over time do customers come back but again that needs to be mitigated with what kind of um product life cycles do you have for your products if you're selling a sofa that's a pretty difficult one to manage manage one measure with transactions as opposed to some of yourself certain sticks so very long answer for a very complex question but i'm yeah. happy to debate the the details yeah it's a big one and it is very personal isn't it as to, to who you are and what you do um will says thanks for the presentation which are the strategies would you say that are most pertinent for driving loyalty in food service such as coffee shops uh again come back to customer experience um I think there's it's interesting I, I worked with Waterstones back in the day and one of their most successful things uh, that they did so they they were looking at a big fancy loyalty scheme and yet the, the stamp the card that you would get stamped with with the, the spots um was all was still a huge success for them and that's one of the big strategies that's most often adopted um by coffee shops I'd, I'd say there's a range of opportunities you don't have to look at those bits of paper it could be you know playlist of the week it's it's i think where businesses really fly is tapping into the skills of the staff the passions of their staff who work there so mm. it, it's not just that customer experience what what do you what music are you listening to um say you will update everybody with a spotify playlist each week if they sign up to your to your you know marketing communications um, that kind of thing really, really works well. And that's you know, the first examples that I showed around um, having a broader conversation than just the product, immediate products and services that you sell. It's really important. I'm writing that down as a note, actually. I, re I really like that. Um, I do have a playlist on, on Spotify. I was just thinking that for my podcast audience. Uh, that's a really, <laughs> thinking it, it's really difficult to engage with people, um, even though uh, like my podcast it's nuts it's in like 143 countries but the biggest problem with with um like a podcast is trying to move people from that platform to somewhere you, you can engage with them you know because they're you know they're listening to you but i thought you know something like spotify which is renowned for its music and creating playlists you could get the audience to create different playlists i really like that that's cool absolutely i mean if you think about you know way back in the day i suspect you're of a similar age to me yeah the idea of you know mixtape and sharing that yeah yeah, yeah. Mix tape is a real you know expression of love and caring mm. and, and we should go back to that we can do it so easily in the in these virtual times you yeah, know, used send, to send them in the post i remember i remember that yeah <laughs> i remember the you know you you knew that you were you were in love when somebody made you a made you a mixtape so when we can do that show, show your customers the love give them a mixtape and and you find that you know a lot of a lot of coffee shops have young funky funky people who uh, probably listen to much more hip stuff than i do uh, yeah get show show your personality that that's what really makes experience work yeah nice nice uh, beatrice says what is your opinion on weekly slash monthly subscriptions 
Uh, it's it, again, how long's a piece of string? So, um, if we're talking just marketing communications, it, it depends what you've got to say. It relevance and engagement is key. Um, I've si I signed up to things which you know a bit of a sucker for anything to do with handbags. And uh, there's one particular newsletter I get which I can get four communications in a day, and I'll open all of them and engage because I can't resist having a look. Um, mm -hmm. Other things I just don't want to hear about that often, or some things are you know just helpful, and I might want to read about them once a month. Um, it's looking at your engagement rates is the key to getting it right. Doing A B testing um, more broad, broadly, um, subscription services, get, getting the timing right is all about testing. Right. And it's built into so many platforms now the ability you know, to, to A B test in a really easy to see way. We do it routinely with some of our customers, a little t shirt company. We didn't know when the right time for a pull up would be. So we did five days on one and 10 days on another. I thought it would be 10 days, and I've been doing this for years. Actually, it's completely wrong. Five days was the optimal time, and it had mm. such a different response rate. So, um, take, make an educated guess and test. That's that's my response to that one. And with regards to communications, again, you know, some businesses, well, a lot of businesses still, still aren't trading. I know, for you know, for example, uh, my wife got a beauty salon. Thought they were going to be opening on July the fourth retract on that no longer allowed to open july the fourth we've obviously got you know thousands and thousands and thousands of gyms you know swimming for that kind of thing that still can't open um do you think you can over communicate with people at the moment or do you think it's you have to to you know position yourself so that when they do open you're at the forefront of people's minds and you, you retain that loyalty yeah, absolutely. I mean, brands like um, David Lloyd, I mean, I'm a member and I've, I've worked on the engagement strategy as well. So, but I have to admit, you know, normally I'm, I would work out fairly unsuccessfully, but at the, be at the gym a couple of times a week. Um, but in terms of juggling a business and kids, I haven't been engaging with that. So for me personally, it hasn't been been particularly productive. But then if you look more broadly at engagement with Online sources of, of um, you know fitness videos, etc. Um, it's been huge, so it's difficult. Measure your audience, talk to them, phone them up. The best brands that I I think have really performed well have actually phoned me up directly and checked in. Um, I cancelled a holiday through Airbnb, and they they called me up. They said, "Are you okay?" <laughs> like, no, uh, just, really, um, yeah, absolutely. Really? Amazing. And it took well, very long, but now I'm, you know, there is no question I will go back to them and book a holiday when I can. And I think that's that's the key thing. It's have it there available, um, but but be flexible in your approach. It, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, how well somebody's done that and, and, the, and the reverse is like, you know, our experience trying to get back tickets to flights to America. And when, you know, that was back in March and now we're in, what, uh, nearly July and it's still you know, zero communicado, it's just us phoning them up and then you, you kind of, I, I get it, they want to keep the money in the system, don't they? They want you to rebook. I totally get it, you know, the industry's on its knees, but um, that's amazing from Airbnb. And I, I've seen, you know, they've literally cut a third of their workforce as well, haven't they? Because they've obviously- Yeah, been absolutely. Massively. Really, really tough for them, but I was really, really pleasantly surprised. I thought it was amazing customer service. And there is no loyalty scheme on the planet that can come out balance that you know that kind yeah. of experience and i think even if you can't open up your store you know how to you know do beauty stuff at home how you know videos silly stuff tiktok videos all mm. of that really helps keep in contact with the customer um, and just keeps that engagement going until the time that you can sit face to face yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wasim says at the start of the webinar, you mentioned segment as a customer data platform. What other underlying tech can best support a multi-channel CRM strategy? Oh, good question. So um, we've used we've actually used segment to actually tie together various um, platforms. I think there is so th there's a whole new generation of CRM and loyalty platforms which are 
uh, really cost effective. Um, we use a platform called Clavio, which is awesome. Um, and that is primarily for, for email marketing, but we've integrated it with an app, which we're launching today for Chelsea Football Club. Um, so that can do in-app push, it can do um, SMS messaging. So there is a whole raft. I think the key thing is whenever you look at a CRM um, platform, they, you know, chuck all the hard questions at them, look under the hood. Um, anything that we now requires a, you know, three month implementation uh, period, just walks straight back out the door again. Mm. Um, the key things is, is the ability to integrate lots and lots of different types of data and push and pull it from wherever because you don't know where your add-ons are going to be in the future you don't know what new things going to come up it's the ease of integrations well-formed apis that you can action pull stuff in and out of that's the key rather than the platform itself but there's certainly a whole new breed that makes life a lot more simple than the big bms like you know salesforce and those guys yeah. they are they're soon going to be on their knees, in my opinion. Mm, yeah, unwieldy, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm working yeah. with clients who are happily ripping them out and replacing them with something that costs four hundred pound a month, rather than you know the the fifteen thousand pound a month that it would yeah. be for at least, uh, without even thinking about the services that you pile on top of it. Indeed. Um, Hannah says, we are at the beginning of our CRM journey. Can you recommend anything to bear in mind when building up the database? Good question, Hannah. Yeah, good question and good luck, Hannah. Um, wow, lots and lots of things to do. Um, just like I said, find a platform. Think about where you store your customer data in the first place because that's your main resource, it's what you know about your customer. <clears throat> be really super flexible about it. I would highly recommend a platform like Clavio. I'd be happy to talk you through it. Although, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a reseller for it or anything, but I have implemented it five times now. Super happy with it. Um, as you start to build up your customers, keep them close, reward them. Um, referral campaigns like weight social referral campaigns where you get people to nominate others it kind of depends what your focus is but i'd say make sure you've got flexibility around your customer data from the get-go i know um lots of people who've set up a business and they've got you know email marketing data over here they've got customer service data over there and particularly as a new business founder it's really difficult then to have the time and resources to pull it all together if you do it from the get-go it makes life a lot easier as you grow and mature yeah and um probably not dissimilar situation to you i, I started my podcast agency a year ago what, what have you found been your your biggest challenges or biggest challenge at the moment would you say it's uh, been, it been obviously been an interesting journey <laughs> given what's happened in the, in the last three months i have to say i don't, I don't know what your experience is <laughs> my my biggest um my my biggest challenges really i mean i'm i uh i have i i'm sort of fairly close to london but i've, I've worked from home for quite a long time uh i'm um, a mother i've got two kids my biggest challenges are stopping my teenage kids from marching in the door when i'm doing this kind of thing or stopping my my dog going absolutely mental when they when their postman comes to the door so um <laughs> i would i would I was already tuned in to, to doing business in this way. So actually, it kind of suits me. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's been fine. Um, it's just a connection. It's like, it's still, you can't beat, you know, meeting up with somebody face to face and forming that emotional connection with somebody. That's what I miss most. Yeah, I, I can hear my teenage daughter doing some kind of TikTok dance uh, on the ceiling above <laughs> my head at the moment. So, uh, and the cat, cats are trying to come in through the window in the in the front rooms but like you I've, I've been used to working from home for a few years now and i've just kind of kind of balanced it up between going into the office um say three days a week and being at home for two days and then alternating that and now i've, I've definitely come to the conclusion i prefer being at home than in the office but <laughs> i still want to have you know that human contact i couldn't do five days and again i was coming to london two three days a week sometime from from paul which is too much but yeah. equally, I'm still kind of craving that. Let's come back into the city and, and meet a bunch of cool brands and have those conversations again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, at the moment, we're working on a really uh, project for uh, Chelsea Football Club, as I mentioned, and mm. it's really 
big challenge with that is normally you'd all be in a room together for that kind of thing you you know with lots of different agencies working on different parts you'd be working in a room you have a chance to you know figure stuff out in the moment um whereas this is you know stuff's being bounced around by email and you know we've been really blessed with this not breaking down but you know, know, the experience of a webinar is <laughs> Yeah, you know, sort of the stilted speech and dropping out every five seconds, and yeah. when, when stuff gets close to the line, that's really painful. Um, and and that, that's another thing: it's just getting in a room with lots of other people, bouncing ideas, figuring stuff out, getting to know where people's pain points are, and and understanding that in advance if you're doing anything. That's that's one of the key things. I again, I miss from working in this way. Um, it just makes it a bit more stilted and and yeah. a bit more bit tougher than it would be otherwise yeah i mean we've, we've we have had a few technical issues peter here who's on here um is com commenting um we, we've had a couple of spectacular failures um but i have to say it's like in the single digits percentage wise compared to you know 90 whatever percent have been successful like this one so i mean i do think i've been thinking the whole time we've been doing these now like coming up to 150 that surely you know the, the the competitors to zoom have been working away thinking how can we actually get a really good um system like this where you actually feel yeah. like you're in the room with somebody you know like some kind of vr thing going on because you the, yeah. the virtual reality headsets are amazing aren't they and you just think surely there's well, some kind of way back in the day so um i can't remember what it's called now but cisco have a meeting room where the whole one whole wall is 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 a, is a screen, ah. and it's also got a like a board table, and you sit one side. So I've actually done, um, you know, had a, a a meeting with a team in China, and it actually felt like we were all at the same table. Wow, uh, it was really amazing. And I know that Cisco actually rent this room out for people um, who've got colleagues or family who live in Australia or long distance at Christmas and periods like that. So, so there's, there are some of those technologies there, and I know that the likes of Google and everybody are desperately trying to 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 catch up. But so Zoom is still pretty well designed. Again, it's about the customer experience, the details that make it work much more, much better than things like Teams on on Microsoft. It just is so much more reliable. Yeah, I was, I was hosting Dell for a webinar the other day. I don't know if anybody watching this was on there. And, and they said that they actually, um, the person hosting it said that they, they own Zoom. And I was like, I didn't know that. So I thought, well, they've, they've done very well at the moment then, clearly, haven't they? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. They're doing pretty Peter well. Says, Peter says, video requires more dependence on language and less on body language, which is a big change indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cool. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up now. Um, so we had quite a few people asking for um, your slides, um, okay. which, which I don't normally get lots of people asking for slides. So clearly yours have, have resonated with them. Um, if I post up your website details here anyway for people uh, yep. to connect with you, which I'm going to do right now. And um, um, as I said before, there's my... Um if you, I don't know if you can actually still show the slides from PowerPoint. Um, if you bring them up again, I can, yeah. All right, okay. So if I, and I can see yeah. the final slide. So um, for everybody who wants to, feel free to reach out to me um, on email. I um, live my life on email like most people. Do feel free to connect on LinkedIn. Love that. Um, you could actually put a, an invite directly into my diary if you really wanted to. And my website is there, although I have to admit I'm a bit like a builder. My own website is not um, as as fabulous as it should be. Um, but do connect. I'd love to hear what you think about the presentation um, and talk about your individual circumstances and, and knock ideas about. And maybe if this is you know, big success, we'll, we'll have follow-up conversations. More yeah. conversations and and what's your email, Jane? I'll type it directly in here as well, shall I? Okay, yeah, it is jane at wr.digital. That's easy. Jane at w, sorry, jane at wr. Dot digital. Dot, I've got it right. Okay, I did get it right. There we go. Okay, brilliant. Website and email address for Jane right there, folks. Um, and yeah, just thank you all very much indeed for joining us today for the last of today's webinars. You all now given permission to get a little bit of sunshine 
over lunchtime. Let's call it lunchtime between one and two before you, uh, you okay. may have to start okay. work again. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Daniela, who's got the same challenge, but with the four-year-olds. Um, Racine, thanks. Pretty similar four and the 14-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there are many parallels. 100% agree with you on that one. Very one's, many. One's a 13, so there you go. Um, yeah, Peter says, please do a B2B one. Um, just remains me to say, pop back again tomorrow, folks. Um, we have got... I think he might be in America now. Last time he hosted a webinar for us, he was in Australia, caught in um, in lockdown. But Ben is going to be back uh, tomorrow, uh, joining us at 10 a.m. I think tomorrow. So check check our schedule. Uh, coming back tomorrow, um, finishing off the week strongly. A second from Hannah on B2B as well. There you go. <laughs> Um, and just to reinforce again, everybody, um, if you found value from this and you think anybody else could equally find value, please share it. It's the replay is going to be available now, literally as soon as I press stop, uh, stop in broadcast. It will be available right on here, literally within about 10 seconds. Um, and it's also going to be available on Facebook Live and Twitter on, on the literally uh in the timeline there as soon as we press pause on that um and then tomorrow as i said I'm joined um by ben kaplan talking about how to become a thought leader during crisis times and that is at 10 a.m tomorrow um peter's asked about tyrrells that was the one that spectacularly didn't work that he simply couldn't get onto the webinar um, to join us. I've, again, no idea why. What I'm going to do on that front, Peter, is our colleagues at Montgomery, when we did a food and drink whole week a couple of weeks ago, they bagged the interview uh, with William Chase, even though I set it up myself. Um, but I'm not bitter about that. So what I'm going to do is get that and see if we can post that up here on ours as a replay. If not, I'll get the link from them. Um, I did interview him on a, on a zoom but that wasn't great either he had two windows open so there was a massive echo like windows open on his computer so there was a massive echo and i couldn't get him to switch that off either so we just yeah wasn't great let's put it that way um simon yes b2b as well wow okay this is proving very popular uh, I'll, yeah you'll have to give me a week or two i've got a few few rather large projects on at the moment but yeah definitely something i'll come back to give yourself a couple of weeks i would say i know what it's like trying to do something in a week like a whole presentation I know, yeah. yeah it's too much it really is um with everything else going on so look thank you all very much indeed jane pleasure to meet you i'll connect with you on linkedin yeah. as well um Brilliant. and enjoy the rest of your day enjoy the rest of the week everybody it's friday thank tomorrow you so much, folks. thank you bye now bye now, bye now.